If you were trapped on a beach where one wrong step means getting eaten alive by a horrifying monster, what would you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the killer beach monster in the sand. This party is going to end in disaster. A crowd of students are having a wild night on a remote beach, and things are starting to escalate quickly. Looking for trouble, these two boys carry over this massive slimy ball they found and place it near the campfire. It looks like something that could be dangerous, but everyone is too drunk to care with no idea that this thing is going to slaughter everyone on the beach. The next morning, this blonde girl Kaylee wakes up from a night of regret and walks out of the lifeguard shack to check on the others. She looks into the car and spots her ex-boyfriend Jonah with another girl. It's upsetting, and when her one-night stand comes out to see her, Kaylee makes it clear that he's just a rebound and it will never happen again. She sees that the group is waking up, and the girl walks away to get some space. But when she takes a look around the beach, she notices something strange. There are sleeping bags and footprints all over the sand, but no one else is here. The whole party has disappeared, and that's when she spots a seagull being attacked by something, horrified as it gets dragged into the sand. On a nearby picnic table, this topless girl wakes up with a hangover and Kaylee realizes the girl might be in danger. She tries to warn her not to touch the sand, but it's too late. As soon as the topless girl steps onto the beach, she can't pick her foot up no matter how hard she tries. Panicking, the girl tells them she's stuck, and the others think she's just being dramatic, but when she screams in pain, they know something is not right. This guy decides to help and climbs out of the car, but as he's running over, he suddenly trips, crashing into the sand. His friends tell him to get up, but the guy starts screaming in pain and can't move. Terrified, Jonah here tries to start the car hoping to save his friend's life, as the kid starts sinking into the sand. Thinking quickly, Mitch here brings out a rescue board from the shack and throws it, but the rope isn't long enough to reach him. Their plans have failed and they can only watch as their friend's face is ripped off before getting pulled into the sand. The group is shocked, as they realize they're stuck on this beach, and they'll die if they take a single step. That's two victims down, and seven more to go. Okay, this is the most horrifying game of the floor's lava that I've ever seen. By simply touching the sand, we'll get trapped to the ground and eaten alive. But nobody has realized yet that this was completely their fault. The night before, they found a giant egg, and it's very likely that whatever's killing them came from inside. To be fair, these kids were incredibly drunk, and that can turn even the smartest of us into complete morons. But look at this thing. It's about four feet in diameter, and is heavy enough that it takes two strong college students to lift. There is nothing natural about it, and clearly doesn't belong on a beach. So this is not something we should be f***ing with, no matter how many tequila shots we've had. Now, this kid jumped into the sand when he thought the girl was in danger, but if we take a step back and look at her options, you'll realize this was the stupidest thing to do. First, Kaylee here warns that there's something deadly in the sand. Then, a topless girl wakes up puking and tells everyone she's stuck before screaming in pain. With those statements, there's only two ways to look at this situation. Either these girls are so drunk that we should just ignore them, or there really is something deadly on the beach. The irony here is that the best decision for both of these scenarios is to stay in the car. Waiting to observe the situation is going to be the best approach until we find out more. Now, the fascinating thing is that if you look around the beach, you'll realize that the monster only wants human flesh. The table and car are still intact, and that means it's not going to eat objects, so this should be the first thing we test out. We need to take stock of everything within reach and use them as stepping stones to get out of here without touching the sand. This car has two surfboards propped against the trunk and are probably six to eight feet long. There's also four removable headrests and at least two rubber floor mats. This is more than enough to help us build a bridge from the car to the edge of the beach behind them, and if we recycle the last item we stepped on, we can walk as far as we want without ever having to touch the sand. Now the problem is that this is just a theory. We need someone to test it, and that's why it's much smarter to let others go first. These are a bunch of hungover, party-going college kids, and if you're the one person that's thinking about survival above all else, it shouldn't be too difficult to take advantage of them. When this kid tries to get out, I would stop him and put the surfboard in his hand to test her idea. Anyone who's willing to risk their lives is a valuable asset to have, but we need to make sure we squeeze out as much information as possible before they get themselves killed. If your friends are going to die, let's at least make sure we get something out of it, or it's a waste of limited resources. As Spock once said, the needs of the many outweigh the few, which brings me to today's sponsor. Star Trek Fleet Command is an open-world real-time 4X MMO where you captain a ship in a three-way space war between Starfleet, the Romulans, and the Klingons. 
The combat happens real time in an open world, and you command your crew made up of classic Star Trek characters such as Commander Data, Captain Picard, and Spock, and send them to explore strange new worlds where no one has gone before. Reach level 5, and you can unlock a free Origins Burnham, and if you also reach level 10 by February 10th, 2022, you'll be given the shards to tear up your Origins Burnham to rank 2. Travel across an expansive universe full of dangerous spaceships and even more dangerous planets. Send officers on expedition missions to the edges of space, acquiring resources and developing new improvements. Team up with and battle alongside your allies for stellar loot, capture territory, pull resources, and dominate the multiverse. You never have to worry about getting eaten by a monster when you're not wearing a red shirt. You can also build and customize your own space station, putting the home in home base, defending it from invaders in battles across the universe. I've only started playing, and I have to say, I'm impressed. It's still getting new monthly rewards and updates with deep story arcs, while featuring a great music score straight out of the movies. For something I play on my phone, it's amazingly cinematic. Star Trek Fleet Command is free to play on iOS and Android. Travel the open world and play by your own rules. Use my link in the description below to download it. Thanks to Star Trek Fleet Command for sponsoring this video. None of the students can believe what they just saw, and Jody here thinks their friend was trapped in quicksand, but nothing else makes sense. This girl Shonda demands to know where her phone is, and Jonah remembers they locked all the phones in the trunk last night. The only way to get them is to step on the sand, and that means there's no way to call for help. Mitch here tells the others to drive the car over and pick them up, but when Jonah turns the key, the car won't start. The battery is dead from leaving the headlights on overnight, and now they have no choice but to wait for help to arrive. That's when Kaylee decides to kneel down near the sand, and Mitch here tells her it's too dangerous to go near it. But the girl has discovered something interesting. Holding her hand over the ground, tiny tentacles come shooting out and try to grab her. Suddenly, this big guy wakes up trapped inside of a metal barrel and starts shouting at the others, demanding they let him out. He tries to shake himself free, but Mitch here explains he needs to stop. There's a monster underneath the sand that's eating people, and if he tips over, he's going to die. The others join in, begging him to calm down, but he finally takes their advice. His friend tells him that in two hours, the tide will come back in, and it should be safe to step on the beach. But until then, he needs to stay inside the barrel. Going back inside, Mitch and the blonde girl sit down to think, uncertain of what to do next. She asks him why he lied to their friend about the tide coming in, and he explains he wanted to comfort the man so he wouldn't panic. But it's only a matter of time before he realizes there's no way to save him. Okay. This kid was smart. Lying to your friend is not something I would normally recommend, but this guy here was on the verge of a panic attack. He had no idea what was going on, was about to tip himself over into the sand and get eaten alive. Giving him hope is the best way to calm him down, and it's exactly what I would do, but there's one extremely important difference here. From a practical standpoint, this man is completely screwed. It looks like he weighs over 300 pounds and was dumped in a trash can while he was sleeping. It should also be pointed out that he has a dick drawn in permanent marker on his face, so it's fair to assume he's not the most popular member in the group. With this in mind, it's too dangerous to risk everyone else's lives to help him, and he's simply not worth saving at the moment. Right now, we need to think about escape above everything else, and that means we need more information. Since we are all spread out on the beach, the best thing we can do is try to figure out if there's a boundary line that the monster can't attack, so we know where to run and how far we need to go before we are safe. This fat guy can help us do just that, because his position gives us a larger radius to find the answer. Now, we know that the monster only responds to flesh, and we can't start cutting off her fingers yet, but we might be able to use our blood to see if it has the same effect. I would tell everyone to draw their own blood and each wipe it on one of the car's headrests. Then, when it's wet enough, we throw them in different directions of the beach to see how the monster responds. Finding out if there's a safe zone is one of the most important things to learn right now, and the more answers we have, the better our strategies will be to escape the beach and survive. In the meantime, we know that the car won't start, but that doesn't mean we can't still use it to get help. This guy mentioned that last night they locked all their phones in the trunk of the car because they wanted to party with Vegas rules, which means all phones are gathered so that if anyone does something stupid, there's no evidence. Well, they certainly got their wish, but it's not the end of the world. These surfboards here are the easiest solution because they can lie them flat on the sand, crawl over the back of the car, and stand on the boards to open the trunk. This is not rocket science even with a crushing hangover, but these kids weren't using any critical thinking, and it's pathetic. 
Their next best option is to keep the keys in the ignition and hog the horn until someone arrives. We know that it still works because Jonah here used it to wake up the topless girl before she got eaten. If it were me, as soon as I realized this beach is going to kill us, I would have had someone press on the horn until the battery completely dies. And even though it's going to be extremely unpleasant for us, it's obviously a much better alternative than being stranded here forever. Later that day, Kaylee searches the lifeguard shack and discovers a book of matches before putting them in her pocket. She asks Mitch what happened last night, and neither of them can figure it out. But that's when he gets distracted and finds a bottle of sunblock in the cabinet. The girl grabs it and runs outside, telling the others to cover themselves up. It's not going to help them escape, but at least they won't die from sunburn. Kaylee asks the group if they remember anything strange during the party, and Jonah realizes that it might reveal a clue that could help them figure a way out. Desperate for answers, she runs through the events of the night before and recalls that everyone fell asleep on the beach except for them. They realize that the rest of the group didn't go home, they've all been eaten, and it's only a matter of time before they die too. Kaylee sees something in the distance and points to the object that the boys found last night. It's split in half like a hatched egg, and the group figures out that whatever was in there is now lurking beneath them. Thinking quickly, she tells them that the creature can't be that big if it's just been born, and suddenly has an idea. Rushing back inside the lifeguard shack, she opens a cooler and pulls out a pack of hot dogs. She rips it open, taking out a sausage, and throws it as far across the beach as she can. The friends all watch as the monster suddenly reaches up and pulls the hot dog down into the sand. Kaylee here is trying to figure out if there's a boundary line where the monster can't reach. The others are skeptical, but her ex-boyfriend thinks it's a good idea. And Mitch here tries throwing a sausage himself, but it gets caught by a passing seagull. The bird lands on the ground to eat, and that's when this guy watches in horror as the seagull gets brutally killed by the monster. Okay. Finally, everyone here is on the same page. A flesh-eating monster is lurking beneath the sand, but the good news is that it's also willing to eat hot dogs and seagulls. This girl had a brilliant idea to figure out where the boundaries are, but the problem is, as soon as she found the snacks, the girl stopped using her brain. Look at the direction she's throwing in. There's no logical reason why you would throw a hot dog towards the ocean, because if we're trying to escape, we should be running back towards civilization. The most important question is how far do we need to go before we escape the monster's reach, and this girl is a complete idiot for throwing the hot dogs in the wrong direction. Now, even though she completely butchered this experiment, this looks like a pack of four hot dogs, so she should still have two left. I would have thrown the last of them this way and start collecting the things we need to cross the sand. The surfboards are the biggest asset we have because together they span as much as 14 feet. But the problem is that we will have to bend down and pick the boards back up each time. This means we'll be putting our hands dangerously close to the sand monster, and that's not a risk I'm willing to take if there's another solution. If it were me, I would try breaking the wooden railing here, because these bars look like they would be the perfect length to dig into the sand and push our way forward. It won't be easy, but using them like ski poles is a lot safer than reaching our hand down every single time we need to advance the stepping stone bridge. And from what we can see here, these tentacles look like they might be able to stretch 4-6 to six inches out of the ground but they don't seem to be attracted to movement and rhythms like the sandworms of doom, so it's a risk that's definitely worth taking at this point. Now, we also have to consider the possibility that there might not be a safe zone at all. This blonde girl made an interesting point that this could be happening everywhere else in the world too. If this is some kind of War of the Worlds alien invasion, then it doesn't matter how far we go, because nowhere is safe. But there's already evidence that this is extremely unlikely. If it was happening on beaches everywhere, then governments would have already been sending rescue teams to investigate the situation. There would be journalists, police, and probably even military to control the disaster. The more witnesses there are, the more likely we would find help. But the fact that this beach is completely empty is a sign that we're the only ones who know. And all we need to do is get to the edge of the beach without touching the sand. Mitch here throws another hot dog in a different direction, and the group watches closely to see what happens. But this time, it lies motionless in the sand. They found a safe zone that's outside the monster's reach, but Ronnie points out that it's too far away from them. Shonda insists they wait until someone comes, but the blonde disagrees, reminding them that it's spring break and they haven't seen anyone else on the beach since they arrived. She thinks it must be a sign that they'll never be found, and for all they know, this monster could be killing people everywhere around the world. Refusing to accept this, Jonah gets out of his seat, grabs a surfboard, and carries it over to the hood of the car. Laid it down against the bumper, he takes another surfboard and places it in front of him to walk across. But the man takes a leap of faith and jumps onto the board unharmed. The creature can't get him, and he starts using the boards as a bridge to make it to the safe zone. 
Jonah here is now playing the most deadly game of the floor's lava, and one wrong move will get him killed. He slowly makes his way across the sand and steps onto the picnic table, but all of a sudden, the surfboard begins to shift backwards. Losing his footing, he catches himself at the last second, but won't be able to hold himself up for long. The others panic, realizing that the monster in the sand is playing with its food, and they're about to watch their friend get eaten alive. Jonah has no chance of escape, as tentacles suddenly stretch towards him, reaching for his stomach. He pulls himself onto the picnic table and reassures the others he's fine, but suddenly collapses in pain. His friends are relieved that he's made it across, but that's when Jonah starts screaming. He's been poisoned by the monster, and there's nothing they can do to help him. Fighting back the pain, he gets up and searches his back for supplies when a banana falls out. The kid quickly picks it up off the ground and suddenly realizes something that will save their lives. He bends down and holds the banana over the sand, moving it along the beach, but discovers that for some reason, the tentacles won't cross the ashes of the campfire. He's just figured out the monster's first weakness and jumps off the picnic table, landing safely on the ground. Okay, this is a big deal. We finally confirmed that there are areas of the beach that the monster can't go, and that means we can all survive once we reach the safe zone. Having said that, this situation just got a lot more horrifying, because now we realize that this creature is sentient. It's learning and adapting to its environment, so we can't just try to escape it, we're also going to have to outsmart it. Now, the good news is there might be a limit to what it's capable of, because Jonah made it all the way to the picnic table before the monster started moving the surfboard. It was only after he lifted his foot that the monster was able to move anything, so it probably isn't strong enough to stop us if our full weight is on the board. Now, even if it's not that strong yet, it's clearly becoming a highly intelligent creature in a very short amount of time. This one simple action implies that our enemy understands dynamic physics, the limits of human anatomy, knows the location of every object on this beach, and can somehow see with its tentacles through sensory perception. It's also suddenly able to reach more than two feet out of the sand, and there's no telling what crazy things it's going to learn how to do next. This is a f scary realization, but the silver lining here is that it's more information we can use against it. So if it were me, I would try to dampen its ability by getting it drunk. If the monster is eating humans, then it has the basic biological components required for consumption to break down its food and absorb the nutrients. This also means that it could be susceptible to alcohol, and that's great news for us, because we still have enough to share. A creature as smart as this means it's relying heavily on brain functions, so we want to figure out how to impair its ability to think and sense the world around it. The main enzyme that is responsible for alcohol metabolism is called alcohol dehydrogenase, and it's actually pretty common in the animal kingdom. Even octopuses have it, so there might be a chance it will work. I would do an experiment and take this vodka here, but pour it over the sand while the tentacles are exposed. Then, reach my hand out again and see if it reacts with the same speed or strength. If there's any indication that the monster's powers can be weakened, then it gives us a tool to fight it off if things get dire, and we just might escape this beach alive. The man eats the banana to celebrate his victory, but that's when he looks down at his stomach in horror. Puss is leaking from his wounds, and Kaylee here tells him to get back on the table so he can look through the bag again. Whatever's inside might save their lives, and he follows her instructions, fighting through the pain. Jonah searches the bag, letting the others know there are mixers inside, and begins tossing out the drinks. He finds a soda and throws it towards the shack, but that's when something goes wrong. The girl screams in horror as blood and pus burst out of the man's stomach, and he lays down on the table while his friends start crying. They know he's next to die, but Shonda here notices the surfboards sliding across the sand. Kaylee realizes that the monster is moving them so they can't escape. It's getting smarter, but they might survive if they can all make it over the picnic table. Suddenly, the girl notices tentacles stretching out towards the car and begins eating through the rubber. The tires pop, and the friends begin panicking as they try to figure out what to do next. But Gilbert here reminds them they still have phones in the trunk. Ronnie here has a clever idea and starts pulling on the back seat, explaining that some cars can access the trunk by pulling the seats down, but they won't budge. Looking for another way to get the phones, she decides to pull a risky stunt and starts crawling over to the back of the car. She carefully finds her balance and inserts the car keys, but when she lifts up the trunk door, there's not enough space. Her legs are blocking it from opening and she doesn't have any room to move. But Kaylee here comes up with a clever idea. She tells Mitch to go find the rescue hook in the shack while the girl climbs back safely into the car. He returns with the hook and Kaylee pushes it out towards the car for the others to grab. Holding the cord, Ronnie steps onto the rear bumper and reaches down to open the trunk. 
their plan works, and everyone is relieved that they might have a chance to get out of here, but that's when everything starts to go wrong. Her foot slips off the bumper, and the girl falls into the trunk, closing the door on her fingers. Okay, this was pathetic. These girls had the right idea to open the trunk, because the phones are definitely their best chance at getting help, but their approach was completely wrong. It's common sense that the trunk needs room to be lifted up, and as long as her legs are in front of the door, there's no possible way for it to fully open. It's very likely that there are rubber mats on the floor of the car, so I would have taken them and placed them down on the sand. This would give us enough distance to open the trunk without blocking it, and we can jump back onto the car as soon as it's open. The truth is, she's already risking her life by hanging over the edge, and it's actually much safer to have secure footing than what they tried. Now, if she isn't willing to risk standing on the beach, there's still a smarter thing to do. I would have taken this towel and placed it in between the trunk opening so that the door won't close when she climbs back on top. This way, the trunk will remain open and they can use the rescue hook to grab the key hanging out of the trunk and pull it upwards. It wouldn't be difficult for Ronnie here to stand on top of the tires and go around the side to reach the phones. Now, it's no question that getting the phones should be our top priority, but there's something really important here that nobody paid attention to. Jonah was able to figure out where the safe zone is because the banana helped him find a boundary that the monster wouldn't cross. What's interesting, though, is that this boundary is exactly on the campfire. We've just identified a weakness, and that's a really big deal, because it means we can try using it to our advantage. I would take the ash from the campfire and spread it out to make a path, using the banana to find out if the monster will cross it. We could also use the ash to cover our entire lower bodies to prevent the tentacles from reaching out and latching onto our ankles. Now, this is a risky thing to try, but Joda here is already injured, and it's only a matter of time before he's too weak to continue. Once that happens, he's no longer useful to the group, so we need to encourage him to test this idea before he becomes dead weight. As Ronnie here screams in agony, the others spot a patrol car driving towards them and call out for help. Keeping his distance, the policeman parks nearby and asks the kids what they're doing here. Kaylee tells him they're trapped by a monster in the sand and he needs to stay inside of his car or else he'll be eaten alive. The cop doesn't believe a single word and thinks they're all high as a kite, but when he steps out of the car to confront them, the man is unharmed. The monster can't pull him down, and he safely walks over to the picnic table inspecting Jonah's wounds. The cop is grossed out, but thinks it's just a horrible case of syphilis and walks away. Mitch here realizes the monster can't grab him because of his thick boots, and the cop walks up to the lifeguard shack asking them both to exit the building. Terrified, the friends refuse to follow his order, and the cop is about to pull his spray out when he accidentally drops his keys. He reaches down to take it, but that was his biggest mistake. The monster has already latched onto his hand and pulls the cop to the ground. He desperately grabs his pepper spray to defend himself, and it's actually working. The tentacles retract into the ground, and the girl is relieved, but not for long. The cop suddenly pulls his arm out of the sand, revealing it's been eaten clean off, and everyone screams in horror as they know he doesn't have a chance of surviving. The monster drags him deeper as Kaylee slowly walks up to him. He begs her to help him escape, but instead, she takes his pepper spray and walks back to her friend, leaving him to die. That's three victims down, and six more to go. With the cop dead, everyone is feeling hopeless, but Mitch here isn't ready to give up just yet. He walks into the shack to grab something, and Shonda here is unimpressed when he comes out with a pair of sandals, explaining he's going to wrap his feet up in towels for extra protection. The girl argues the monster will eat through whatever he's wearing, but the boy points out that it's their best chance at finding help, but his plan is about to go horribly wrong. Okay, these guys should have escaped a long time ago. Mitch here has finally figured out what he needs to do to outsmart the monster, but there's one detail that changes how we look at this entire situation. The truth is, these students wouldn't have needed to risk their lives doing any of this if they had known exactly what to say to the cop as soon as he arrived. Nobody is going to believe us if we say we're being attacked by a monster that hatched out of an egg, and it devours people in less than 30 seconds if we touch the sand. It's completely ridiculous, and it's just going to make the cop less empathetic to your problem. We can't tell him that there's a monster because we'll lose all credibility, and he won't take us seriously. We need to be very strategic to not waste this opportunity, so the smartest thing to do here is to actually lie. If we tell him the truth, he's going to make us leave the beach, but if we tell him we saw someone planting a landmine and are terrified of stepping on the sand, he's going to call for backup. We have to scare him with a threat that he's prepared to believe, and when more officers come, there will be enough witnesses to realize the real threat hidden beneath. Now, Kaylee here decided to walk up and take his pepper spray, but left the man to die. 
It's cold-blooded as hell, and I love it, but there was one thing even more valuable that she completely ignored. When this cop stepped out onto the sand, he was able to walk around completely safe from the monster because he had these huge boots on. If cold-blooded is how we want to play this, then as soon as he got stuck in the sand, I would have told him to stretch his legs out to the ramp so that we can pull him up to safety. He would agree in desperation, and once his feet are close enough to the edge, I would pull off his boots and leave him to die. These things are much more useful than pepper spray because they will actually let us leave this place, but Kaylee here settled for less, and it's about to get someone else killed. Even though it's not the best outcome, this cop dying is not the end of the world, because his disappearance won't go unnoticed. This man is an on-duty officer, and if dispatchers don't hear back from him, or he doesn't return to the station, the entire department will know something is wrong. They have the tools to track him down to this beach, because onboard laptops inside of police cars have GPS tracking that's keeping tabs at all times, including when the engine is turned off, so they should be able to find him easily. The bad news is, there doesn't seem to be any sign of an onboard computer or mobile radio system. That means even if the students get in, there's no way they can personally contact anyone for help and nobody is keeping track of the vehicle's location. The only hope they have is that the cop reported their case as he was driving over here and someone from his department fails to contact him. With no better options, Shonda throws him a towel to cover his feet, but as he's leaning over the railing, it breaks and he falls into the sand below. The others can do nothing, as the monster's tentacles inject their poison, paralyzing him. He's just become another victim of the beach, and gets eaten alive in front of their eyes. That's four victims down, and only five more to go. With another friend dead, Kaylee here is feeling hopeless, but notices the railing being moved by the monster and comes up with a new plan. She orders the other girl to get on the hood of the car and grab the railing as it moves towards her. Acting quickly, she follows the instructions, and that's when the blonde girl climbs over the metal rails before jumping straight into the car. Joining Shonda, she climbs to the back, and together they manage to lift up the trunk door. Ronnie's finally free, and wraps her mangled fingers in a towel. The girls realize they need to get over to the picnic table to rescue their friend, and take him to the patrol car where they'll be safe. But things won't be that easy. The girls start placing the railings on the ground, and Shonda makes a path to the picnic table first. She reaches her boyfriend safely, and Kaylee here manages to cross without any problems. But when this blonde girl tries to walk over, things go wrong. She suddenly stops in place, looking down at her bleeding hand, and loses her balance. Thinking quickly, Kaylee sprays the ground with the mace right before the girl hits the sand. She screams in terror, and the others expect her to be dragged under the surface, but nothing happens. The girl is fine, and reaches a hand out to her friends for help, but suddenly, the monster grabs a hold of the girl, pulling her into the beach. That's five victims down, and four more to go. With the patrol car nearly in reach, Shonda climbs over the table and picks up the bag. She tells the blonde Mitch had the right idea, and begins covering her feet in a protective layer of cloth. But the survivors never notice that tentacles are reaching out for Gilbert's barrel, and the monster is about to have its main course. Okay, Shonda here is the only one left who's thinking straight. The cop already proved that they're safe as long as their feet are protected, so all they need is enough covering, and they'll be able to walk in the sand but these girls wanted to cross this narrow wooden plank instead. Now, to be fair, someone has to do it, because this cloth is at the wooden table, but to have the other two girls follow her is really stupid. All we need is one person to get to the squad car, because if we find a way to call for help, then we're going to be saved anyways, and we can just stay where we are without risking our lives. Now, Shonda was brave enough to take the initiative and risk her life first by walking across the railing, but nobody stopped to consider if this was even the best approach to begin with. The the first problem is that these wooden planks are sticking out of the sand, with the most narrow side facing up. This gives them less surface area to balance themselves and make it across. It's dangerous, and if it were me, I would have tried to disconnect all the wood to make sure we could step on the widest side. Secondly, the more points of contact we have with the ground, the more stable our position is, so I would have taken this plank and used it as a walking stick to make sure I don't fall. Now, it's worth pointing out that we don't actually have the keys to the squad car because it was pulled into the sand with the policeman. That makes things a lot more challenging if we don't find any battery-powered communication devices inside. But there's one thing I would be looking for that would solve this problem. There's no guarantee, but it's very possible this patrol unit has jumper cables somewhere in the car, and even if we don't have the keys, we might be able to jumpstart the convertible. Seeing the patrol car nearby, Shonda here runs as fast as she can until the girl finally makes it to the vehicle. They're so close to escaping and everyone is excited to leave, but then Gilbert starts to panic. The others watch, horrified to see their friend get wrapped up by three massive tentacles that drag him straight into the beach. That's six victims down, with only three more to go. 
the girls break down in tears, having to see another friend get killed, when all of a sudden, a giant tentacle bursts out of the ground and pulls on the car. Knocked off balance, Shonda comes crashing down into the hood and falls unconscious. Kaylee is now all alone, and the girl's overwhelmed, thinking she might have to leave everyone here to die if she wants to survive. That night, Shonda wakes up and the blonde is relieved she's okay, but they both know they're running out of time to escape. The girl searches the police car for something they can use and finds an emergency raft on the roof. She drops the pack on the beach, and to Kaylee's relief, it begins to automatically inflate. Waking up Jonah, the girls help him walk over to the life raft, and Shonda here gets inside the car first. The boyfriend is next to enter and makes it in safely, but when Kaylee approaches, the whole beach begins to shake. She loses her balance and falls into the life raft as a massive tentacle bursts out from the sand. The girls stare at it in terror, and the monster swings around, slamming the door shut. Desperate, Kaylee climbs on top of the car's roof and heads to the back, where she finds something that might save their lives. It's a fuel canister, and she tries to pull it up, but another tentacle pierces straight through, spilling the gas. Kaylee spots another canister and drags it onto the roof before dumping the fuel on the ground. She pulls the book of matches out of her pants and lights it on fire as the monster returns to kill her. Throwing the flaming pack onto the sand below, the ghastly ignites and the creature starts to burn. The girl stares, shocked that she might be able to kill this thing, and quickly climbs back down into the vehicle. The girls wait inside as the monster begins attacking the car, but it suddenly stops and leaves the survivors alone. That's when the blonde realizes the boy isn't breathing and holds his hand as he dies. That makes seven victims down, with only two left standing. The next morning, the girls are woken up by a knock on the car window and see a man standing outside. He's not being attacked by the monster and the blonde opens the door in shock, looking down at the sand. The creature has completely disappeared and Kaylee here builds the courage to step out onto the beach. They're safe and the two girls can finally get out of here. They walk away from the car, relieved that spring break is finally over. But now they'll both have to find new boyfriends before school starts. But what do you think? How would you beat the sand? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How To Be playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.